Hello, okay, right. Today we are going to look at the Underground Mathematics website. We're just going to give you a little bit of a tour of how things work, what we're trying to do here, and how some of the resources that we provide on this website can be really helpful to you as you are teaching the new linear A level and as you're setting up your new schemes of work for starting in September. We are currently on the home page of the website and we're going to be using the live website to demonstrate everything today. So this is exactly how it will look on your screens if you try um, to browse to the website during the session or after the session in your own time. On the home page you will see the tube map. Now this is the main feature of our website and it's really, really important to us. It is the way we have chosen to connect mathematical ideas and topics. So rather than um, tailoring what we do to a particular syllabus or exam board, we actually organize it by our own system. And this means that everything that we do is applicable to OCR if you're using OCR, but also to any other classes that you're using the maths with. We have five thematic lines that we base all of our resources around. These are laid out in different colors. So at the side here, you'll see all the different options. We have blue is the number line, red is the geometry, and so on. On the lines, you'll see these headings. At the moment, I'm pointing at thinking about number. This is a station, and this is where all of the resources that we will be showing you today are housed at these stations. The tube map design is important to us because it really emphasizes the connections between mathematical ideas and topics. This is something that's really, really important with the new linear A level, and it's something we've worked quite hard on to try and demonstrate some, and it has to be just some, unfortunately, because there are so many connections between the maths that we teach students post-16. A couple of practical things just to note before we go any further. On some of the stations, you will notice there is a hammer symbol. This is because underground math is an ongoing project and we haven't yet completed everything. Where there is a hammer, that means the station is under construction. It doesn't mean there is nothing there for you to use. It just means that it is not complete. So it's still worth browsing to stations that have hammers against them. There will be resources there, but they won't be as well resourced as some of these other stations that don't have hammers next to them. Similarly, there are a couple of stations on the tube line, for instance, complex numbers, which currently have no entry symbols. This is a station that has nothing for you to view, and you cannot view that as a public user at this time. But over time, resources would become available within that station and others like that. Something else that's very important and fundamental to our philosophy at Underground Maths is the pervasive ideas wheel down here. Pervasive ideas are these ideas that are really difficult to shoehorn into one topic. They actually pervade throughout mathematics, and unfortunately sometimes um, in the old modular system they became individual chapters in, in textbooks rather than being something that we talk about all the time whenever they crop up within all the different subjects. And sometimes it's hard to know when they crop up. So we are using this as an opportunity to flag up when particular resources are covering these some of these pervading ideas. We will show you where they occur in some of the resources we look at today, and there'll be lots of occurrences of them throughout the website if you choose to then have a little look further. Now, I'm going to hand over to Anna, who's now going to talk about an individual station. We're going to go to Introducing Calculus. So all of our stations follow uh, the same idea. There is the key question at the station, which here is, why did calculus develop and how might we use it? Just to give you a, a sense of the sort of things that might be looked at at the station, alongside those key questions, which just delve a little bit deeper into the mathematics that will be looked at. Now, this is an interesting station in that it's really about introducing the ideas behind calculus rather than introducing any of the uh, particular formal methods that you use to either differentiate or integrate. All the stations are split into three sections. We've got introducing, developing, and review questions. 
Now, the introducing and developing sections are the rich resources that the underground mathematics team have written and put together, and we'll be looking at some of these in a second. The review questions are slightly different, and these are past exam questions. Uh, they could be from O level or A level, they might be step questions, and these are presented as they would have been written in the exam, and they have fully worked solutions as well. So they're very different to the rich resources above, but equally useful in the classroom or as homework and a really valuable source of uh, opportunities to find interesting questions, especially with the new A-level coming in. So we're going to have a look at the problem of approximating areas. You may have noticed that we have different resource types throughout our resources at the station. Okay, again, this is just to help you understand the sort of resource you might be looking at. Each resource, if you wish to get a little quick overview, you can open that and you can see that this approximating areas is about being, sorry, is about putting four shaded areas in increasing order of size. Now we're going to have a look and we're going to ask you uh, a question in a second. Just as Antonio mentioned, we would like to see your answers. So if you could make sure that when you write into the chat box that you're writing to the presenter, that would be really helpful. So we'll be able to see what you're telling us. So if we go to approximating areas, we'll explain the layout of the resource uh, and the resources in general afterwards, but we'd like you to look at the question. So it says, consider the shaded area under each function shown on the cards. Put the cards in order of size of the shaded area from smallest to largest. Now we'd like some immediate reactions to this. Do you have any instincts, any idea immediately about what the smallest area would be, which card, and what the biggest area would be? We would love to see some of your replies, um, so please send those through to us. So which do you think the biggest area is? And maybe how confident are you that that's the biggest area, just from having a quick initial look? And again, which do you think the smallest is? This is the sort of question we would ask students if we were using this resource with them. Before we're expecting them to do any serious calculations, just asking them to try and get a feel, in their opinion, for what's going on. And then we can think about what we might do to become more confident about our answers. Great, some of you are giving us your largest and smallest. Some of you are actually just putting the four in, in an initial order, which is also great. I'll just give you a little more time to think about that. While you're having that think, I will just show you one of the features of this particular resource is that it is an interactive card sort. So if you're using this with students in the classroom, you can move different ones into different orders. You can bring them to the front if you want to focus on a particular graph, and that can be quite helpful if you want students to, to be able to feedback and, and, and use the graphs on the screen. So what I think is interesting about seeing some of these responses coming in is that our initial reactions are not all the same, and that's exactly what we'd expect from students. It's really hard to tell without doing more, which one is going to be smallest and biggest. We might have some instincts, but we need to realise certain things about those graphs. As someone's just said, we need to think about the scale on the y-axis. We need to think about what the function is doing. We need to think about this type of function, whether it's linear, whether it's quadratic, whether it's got what type of curvature it's got. There's lots and lots of little things that we need to consider if we're actually going to become more confident about those answers. So if we stop thinking about our initial reactions now and think about how we could go about confirming or becoming more confident about our order. Let's say we've guessed an order. One of the ones that was suggested was um, C, A, D, B. So if I pop them in that order on the screen, 
C A D B. So let's say we've made that made that um, decision that those that was the order we thought they were in. How could we then go about confirming this? And I would like to remind you, this is at the introduction to calculus station. So as Anna said earlier, we are not expecting students to actually use the machinery of calculus here. So this is a great opportunity to our students, once they've had that initial thought, uh, of which they think is the biggest or the smallest, of how they're then going to try and verify or, or back up their initial ideas. Um, and obviously, if they haven't met any machinery of calculus, then you hope they're going to start thinking about which ones they can work out exactly and which ones they're going to have to approximate and, and how they might approximate them. Okay, so I'm hoping that some of you have started to go a little bit further to try and confirm whether or not you're right, whether or not this particular arrangement is correct. As I'd hope we noticed fairly quickly as teachers, A and B can be calculated exactly. But even calculating those is not necessarily straightforward for our students, so even that activity is worthwhile. C and D, however, we would normally turn to integration. However, what we'd expect and what we would hope our students would do is to find methods of approximating them. Now, this is where there is some flexibility in use in this. You could use this after having introduced some methods of approximating, for instance, the trapezium rule. But you could use it, and it is designed to be used, even before that. So actually just asking students to estimate areas. And I would hope that some will think about triangles, some will think about rectangles, some will think about trapeziums, and they will start to explore how they could estimate those areas. One of the things that's most important with this is to recognise that it's not just a case of getting one answer for each card. For C and D, because they are estimating, they have to recognise that what they're getting is either an underestimate or an overestimate. And if they can drill down to narrow that band of possible values, they will be able to place those cards in order, even if they do not know the exact value for those areas. Now, a couple of useful notes using it with students in the classroom. C is much, much easier to place in order with A and B than D. So when I'm working it out myself, or when I'm suggesting support for students, I would suggest using A, B, and C initially. Because the curvature of the graph makes it much easier to decide whether it's an under or overestimate, it means it's, you can get a, an accurate enough estimate very, fairly quickly using rectangles. With D, you actually need to go pretty precise to be able to get it accurate enough to place it in order. And that means that there's opportunities with D to discuss whether spreadsheets might be useful Certainly, I think if you're using rectangles, you need to go down to the level of um, bar width of 0.1 to be able to be certain about your um, placement of it in order. So having access to technology, having access to spreadsheets, if the students want to use them, enables them to start to recognize how we may be summing these smaller and smaller values when we're thinking about integrating under a curve. Now, some of these things that I'm mentioning are discussed in teacher notes. Every resource on the website has teacher notes, and I think now is a really good time just to bring this up, because as we design our resources, we obviously have ideas about how they might be used, and it's, it's important that you understand where we were coming from if you're going to um, find our resources easy to use and, and useful. So we always describe why we think it's useful to use the resource giving them a bit of background, a bit of context. And then we try to suggest anything helpful under these headings. These headings appear in the teacher notes for every resource. So they're all of the same format. So possible approach 
can be a very helpful starting point. It, it helps just to set the scene as to where we think we might start using this for students. Key questions is also a good place to have a glance um, before you use it in the classroom. We do also discuss possible support and extension. We will often put links to other problems on the website to help you to sequence lessons uh, within a topic. These links to other resources also appear in the sidebar at the resource. As you can see, that same resource is over here, problem areas. And so it's just suggesting that if you're looking at this particular approximating areas, then that might be another one to, uh, to do at that point in, uh, in your lessons as well. Yeah, and we'll click on that in a second just to show you what that looks like and show you a little bit of the progression. But before we do that, I will just show you the rest of the screen. Um, we've just been asking you to place them in order. Um, down here, we do actually specify how did you decide which one had the smallest. So there is a, an element of justification necessary. And we do provide you with the precise values so that everything is available to you and you can choose how you, to, how you, how you want to share that with students in the classroom, if at all, or whether you're just going to use that for your own use. At the top of the page, you will have noticed there are multiple tabs, and this is, again, typical of all of our resources. The problem is the main page. It, it's where we set the mathematical task. Other tabs, for instance, this one, are a form of solution, and they are designed to be used by you as a teacher and by students if that's, if that's what you would like them to look at. They are not numerical solutions in the same way that a lot of uh, resources will provide solutions. These are works narratives. We describe the journey through a problem, and often this means we will intersperse it with questions to the reader or questions that you as a teacher might choose to use in the classroom with your students. If I scroll down the page, we use a lot of diagrams in these pages. And all the time we're trying to pose these questions, for instance, here where my cursor is, trying to think about things that would just make us think that a little bit harder about what it is we've done. And this is a particular activity where if we do keep questioning those students, they will have to delve deeper, but if we don't question them, potentially they would just put them into an order without thinking quite so hard. So the questions we use with this kind of thing are very important. If I go back up to the top now, that's the main problem. The other thing I'd like to mention on the resource page is the printable and supporting materials. Again, this is available for every resource, and what it provides you with are PDFs of every section of a resource. And also, if there are particular useful extra parts to a resource that would be useful for printing, for instance, cards to cut out in this example, then they are available here. So these can be downloaded and saved if you don't want to use the online versions. These can be downloaded and printed. These can be shared with students. These can be emailed to colleagues. However you wish to use them, you've got different ways of accessing the materials. OK, so we're going to have a look at a different resource now. So we'll just uh, go to back to the map. Now, you can do this by clicking on the map button up here, or by clicking on the logo, which would take you back to the home screen. But if we use the map, we just get a pop-up, and we see the tube map again. So we were looking at introducing calculus, which was on our calculus line. We're going to go now to polynomials and rational functions. Um, and just another mention of the map and the idea that there isn't one route through our map. Um, and that's the nice thing about having something different to a list of topics. Uh, so there's no one way to, uh, to travel along our tube map. So as I said, the stations all look the same. You can see we still have our, our key questions here and our different sections. We're going to have a look at a many ways problem called can you find cubic addition? And we'll show you in a minute, but you can also see at the station level that this contains uh, an interactive element, in this case, something uh, based on a GeoGebra app. So we'd like you to have a read through the problem. 
says, can you find a cubic curve that? And there are five different parts to the question. We'll give you a little bit of time to have a look, uh, see what you can come up with. If you have any thoughts or any answers, again, please uh, feel free to type them in and send them to us. Something that we are particularly interested in with this question, um, with you being teachers, is actually which one might you choose to do first? And what might you do first in order to answer it? I'm going to repeat the questions just while you're thinking about and reading the problem we have on the screen. What we'd like to know from you, so what we'd like you to type in, is when you've had a read through, which one might you choose to do first? And what might you do first in order to try and find a cubic that would satisfy that particular example? So we've had a, a nice interesting point that I think we should uh, share with everyone that someone suggested they would do A first um, as that's what students would do, um, which I think we'd all agree with. They're likely to, to start at the beginning. But actually that's often a feature of, of our resources that it may be that students might not find the first one the most simple to tackle and actually that they do have the flexibility to, to look at the others and perhaps dive into the, a resource somewhere else than, uh, than at the beginning. And I think that's often slightly more unusual to what they're used to doing uh, in terms of perhaps exercises. So we've had some suggestions of equations. Something that I would like to know though is, um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. I'd like to know how it is that you as teachers are thinking about solving the problem. What is it that you're doing first? So if I'm less interested in an answer, because I'm going to assume that you can all find cubics that would satisfy these conditions, actually what approach are you taking? And is it the same approach for every one? Or are you taking different approaches for different ones because of something that's telling you that you should think about it in a particular way? And is it the same approach that you think your students would take, or do you think they would be doing something different? Okay, we're going to give you just 30 seconds more, and then we're going to share some of our thoughts on this.
Okay, this is a problem that does take a bit of thinking about to understand exactly where you might uh, pick up students on certain things or have opportunities to draw out particular things with your students. It's something that we've spent quite a lot of time playing about with. Um, and so we can talk about the things that we've noticed as well. Something that's very important to me with this resource and with a lot of our resources is actually encouraging students to sketch. So before they think algebraically, just thinking about what it should look like. And this is something that's very hard to communicate in a webinar and, and when you're typing in a chat box. Some of you have suggested that you would sketch things. And it's something that we think is just so important to just connect the algebra and the geometry of the situation. Um, a lot of them probably would think about finding the factors and working algebraically. But even then, encouraging them just to think about whether the sketch would help them to determine whether it's unique or not would really help to deepen that understanding. Yeah, as someone pointed out, A has that element of choice. You're only given the two routes. And so that idea of the sketch and seeing the different options for that third route is really valuable. Yeah, it can be a way of convincing a student who thinks they're finished that actually there's an awful lot more to explore. Now on that note, I'm just going to show you some of these other tabs because a lot of what we're saying here, we've written down and we've communicated in these. So first, the Explore tab. Now, in this section, we aren't providing answers so much as a, a place for you to use in the classroom or students to use if they've got their own computers um, to explore some of these curves. So we've embedded a couple of GeoGebra applets that would allow you just to play about and just see the impact of changing certain things on those graphs. So really thinking about how those coefficients are affecting behavior, the roots, the turning points, and just getting us a feel, a better feel for how a cubic is behaving. We have another one down here that you could also choose to play with. Now also the things you might have tried to have, similar to the last resource, this is where we actually go through some of the solution as such. In this case, obviously, there is no one solution, but we can discuss methods. Now in this case, this is where I really want us to look at these sketches. This is such a powerful way of just satisfying yourself about the types of curves you can have, thinking about whether it's unique or not, and how you can work systematically to think about all the possible curves that will satisfy a particular set of conditions. So this is some curves that were satisfied or should be considered for the conditions in A. So even before thinking algebraically, even before identifying very much at all about the problem, it's giving us a really, really good sense for what sort of thing we're looking for. And this is something that you could choose to use as a stimulus for students. You could use this image either as part of a plenary or very early on with students after initial reactions, just to make sure that they're not shutting down after they've considered one one solution that they've found or one particular method that someone next to them has thought about. It just opens things out. And these are available for each of the sets of conditions as well. You'll notice here we do then, obviously, discuss the algebraic point of view as well because both are incredibly important and it's actually the connections between the two that we want to emphasize. Okay, now, this resource obviously still has teacher notes as well. What I'd like to draw our attention to though is this. Every title of a resource has a star next to it. Now if you click on the star, you get an option to log in or register. Now all of our resources are free. You do not have to log in to use them. However, if you do sign up for a user account, then it gives you some options in terms of personalizing what you're looking at. So this star here, you'll see it comes up with a little description add to your resource collection. If I am logged in and I click on that star, it basically bookmarks it. So if I then go to my area of the website, so if I went over to the user area and clicked on there and I was logged in, I would see any resources that I have chosen to add to my collection. Within that, I do have the facility then to sort the resources into different folders. 
essentially different collections. So if I've got favorite resources that I want to use with a particular year 12 class, I can actually group them together on the website. Similarly, I can have different folders for different classes, different year groups, different topics, and I can build it up that way. And it means that then, if I'm in a hurry, I could come back to the Underground Maths website. I know that everything's up to date because I'm using the live versions, but it means that I've got everything to hand and I know where it is. And if I'm trying to share with other teachers and colleagues, it means I've got a bank of things that I know are going to work and things I've tried and I'm happy with. So that can be really useful to do. I'll just highlight the right-hand side again. We've got links to other resources. So Curvy Cubits is another resource that here it says look forward. So Curvy Cubits is a resource we would suggest using after this resource. Looking around means resources that are sort of dealing with similar ideas but don't necessarily need to go before or after. So how not to solve a cubic looks at some similar things. We have a link to one of our pervasive ideas here, thinking about constraints. And we have some other tags thinking about representing maths, generalizing, specializing, visualizing. These tags can be helpful for you when you're thinking about what your students are um, dealing with when they're looking at particular problems. Some of the tags include things like modeling and mechanics. Uh, so they might be particularly useful in terms of keeping an eye on those with regards to uh, teaching the new A level. Yes, and all of the tags are searchable. So if we now go to the search, we can choose to search for, for instance, as Anna was saying, one of the tags is mechanics. And it will bring up any resource that is, has that tag associated with it. So that can be quite a useful way of looking for something very specific. What I would like to search for, though, and just demonstrate for you, we were looking at the resource called Can You Find Cubic Edition. Now, Can You Find is actually a model of a resource that we've used in different ways. If I type in can you find, you'll see that there are other problems in a similar format. So there is another cubics edition, there's an asymptote edition, a trigonometry edition, and so on. Because this format's quite a nice open way of asking some questions about some perhaps quite straightforward topics, it, it's a really good one to revisit. We'll look at this one very briefly as an example. So the trigonometry edition, you'll notice it looks very similar on the page. It's the same, sort, same style of question being posed. Can you find this, this, or this? We are still encouraging the use of graphs. We often put links to Desmos. Obviously, you can use any graphing software, but we quite like Desmos because it's very quick and easy to use. Um, you don't need to download anything. You don't need to install anything. It's, it's just there online. Um, and thinking about graph sketching as well. Now, we're not going to look at this particular resource, but we will go back to the station that this resource sits at, which is the trigonometry triangles to function station. Now, you notice trigonometry is a nice, important topic. We can see we've got four of our tube lines meeting here. If we go down, we're going to have a look at something called slices of pi. Now, again, it's got something slightly different next to it. Um, which shows that there's some extra or some more detailed teacher support involved in this particular resource, which is why we're going to have a look at it. Now, we're not going to spend too much time sort of thinking about doing this resource, um, but we will give you time just to have a look and see what is being asked here. So we have this lovely diagram, and it's been made using inequalities involving sine theta, cos theta, and tan theta. And each section, or each sector, sorry, is defined by a different inequality. So you're given this information, uh, and then there are some questions hidden beneath a toggle. So it might be that actually you ask students to say what they've noticed or what questions they have before providing them with the questions that we've asked. And again, this is something that runs through a lot of our resources, spending that time to take in a diagram and to see what you notice, make your own conjectures or have your own questions. It's something that's encouraged throughout the underground math site. The questions that are asked here look at working out what inequality has been used to define each sector, 
and then thinking about which the biggest sector is and whether you can extend that diagram. So it's a really nice resource to think about you know, sort of bringing all your, your three trig functions together initially using graphs and inequalities and maybe your exact values. Okay, it really brings in lots of things that you would like your students to know when they're dealing with their trigonometry. Again, this has a pervasive idea if we go up to the sidebar of symmetry. It just means that symmetry would be a good idea to keep in mind when you're thinking about this problem. It's likely that symmetry will be mentioned in the solution or the things you might have noticed in this case, and it's just good to be aware that that's part of the problem. I'm just going to click on this just because I want everyone to be aware that these are provide these do come with information. So each of these pervasive ideas does have a piece of writing with examples exa and links to resources that are good examples of where the pervasive idea is explored. These are pop-ups, so they just appear in the screen. You can either close them here or you can click away. And then that's very easy for you to refer to as a teacher if, you're, if you want to look a little bit deeper when you're planning. Now, Anna mentioned that this is a resource in action. This has an extra level of teacher support associated with it. And you'll see that here. We have a different, a purple icon next to the normal teaching notes. So if I click on there, this particular resource is accompanied by some video of some teachers discussing how they would use the resource with their students and how they have found it worked. So thinking about their um, ideas of how it might go and then reflecting on how students responded to it. Videos are something we are building up a collection of within the resources in action section. So resources in action is not limited to this one resource. If we click this way, we will see a number of resources that have more support associated with them. Now, what you will notice is that there are different types of support. Video is one. So here, this bullet point at the top, videos of students working on the task. In that case, it was videos of teachers discussing the task. There are other things that we've used. So this resource at the top here, discriminating, this actually also includes some much more detailed teacher notes thinking about preliminary tasks, thinking about follow-up tasks, and some examples of student work from the classroom that have been included to help you to think about where misconceptions might arise, predict what your students might choose to do with these questions, and help plan accordingly. So these are ideal for anyone who maybe isn't feeling confident at using which tasks in the classroom or is just new to underground maths and wants a little bit of extra support, there's opportunities here to really get some detailed ideas about how you might use the resource, whether it's through the notes or through watching the resource being used by other teachers. Now, you will notice that this page is, is purple. This is different to the rest of the site. What we have done is we have put all of these support materials, so more generic support materials, into a special, a special section of the website called Your Mathematical Classroom. Now, from this page, I can get to it by clicking here. I could have got to this page from the main home page. If I go back to the Underground Maths home page, Your Mathematical Classroom is a main link on that page because we think it's so important. Now, I'm going to very briefly discuss some of the other things within this support page. As you'll see, there's a lot. So there's, there's more for you to explore in your own time. First, I'd like to just mention these bundles. Bundles are another way of presenting our resources. Because we are aware that we have presented them on a tube map, that is something that we have designed based on content, we also want to think about other things that we care about in the classroom. So we have put together bundle, a small collection of resources within each bundle. So it's up to five or six resources that deal with a particular way of helping your students develop as mathematicians or particular things that you might like to try in the classroom. So the first bundle here is developing a mathematical classroom. This was designed to be used at the very beginning of the year um, to help establish certain 
uh, rules of the classroom, certain behaviours, thinking about encouraging that mathematical questioning, mathematical thinking when students are looking at problems. Um, at the start of the year is an ideal opportunity when you've got lots of students coming in from different schools to start, start off in that way. We've also got one based on using student work as a resource. As I mentioned, we often include examples of student work within our resources. One on questioning. And the most recent bundle, tying it together, is thinking about revision. So as some of you may have been thinking or you may have noticed if you've seen resources in the past, a lot of our problems, because they are so rich, are ideal for revision because they draw together a number of topics and they really force students to think much more deeply about how they are using those topics and it tests understanding rather than recall. So these can be ideal for that and within this bundle we suggest a set of resources, six in this case, that are perhaps good examples that you might like to pick out and use. You will notice slices of pie that we just looked at is within that. Now very quickly the structure of a bundle You'll notice there is a why you use this bundle and a how we use this bundle. If I click on those, with each bundle we present a little bit of text just describing from our point of view why the bundle exists and why we think you should use it as a teacher, or why we think it would be useful to you. So it gets across any key ideas that we have and things that you might find within the bundle. How to use the bundle is fairly self-explanatory. Again, it's just getting across some of the key ideas that we had when we were making this bundle. Each bundle so far has been accompanied by a webinar. Recorded versions of these are available on the website. If we go back to the Your Mathematical Classroom page, there is a link to the webinars here. So if you did want to know a little bit more and you enjoy listening to the webinar format, then you could try looking at some of those. The final page we want to mention in this section, as we said, please explore at your own time, is this page on preparing for the new A-level. So it just has three different sections. It has a summary of the changes, which if you've been listening to some of OCR's other webinars, I'm sure you're aware of. Then it's just talking about how underground maths can help, specifically uh, to do with the overarching themes. Hopefully you've seen today how our resources can help problem solving, as we mentioned there's modelling resources and throughout our resources that idea of argument and language and proof and, uh, and bringing that out of reasoning and justifying uh, really comes out through throughout our resources. But perhaps the uh, most practical is uh, a spreadsheet that we've put together that you can download here and it contains the content uh, from the DFE specification for the A-level and within each content statement, we've given some resource suggestions and as well as review questions. Uh, there might be one or two or three for each uh, content statement, uh, and that will just help you hopefully plan your scheme of work or just plan a particular topic and maybe make it easier to just finding what you're looking for as you think about uh, teaching from September. I would point out the resources flagged up in the spreadsheet are our favourite examples for those particular topics. They are not the only examples. So if you're looking at something and it looks a bit sparse, it's still worth going back to the website. If you're looking at it and you just want other ideas, go back to the website. There are hundreds of resources already existing at the stations, lots of which we have not flagged up on this spreadsheet because it would be too crowded. Okay. Now, we've reached the end of what we needed to say, so we are now in a position to answer questions, and you can type those in. We will be handing back to Will just to say a few words from OCR at this point, but as I say, we will still be here and still be responding to questions um, should you have any that you'd like to ask, either about underground maths or about OCR. Thank you uh, very much, Tantha and Anna, for this um, uh, for, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I've, I've uh, seen uh, both both of you speak at uh, various events, and I'm always amazed by the richness and the deepness of the resources, as well as all the support and, and so on. So it's not just resources, but uh, the whole package uh, to, to support uh, teachers uh, using these rich tasks in the classroom. Um, I'm just going to run through uh, a couple of um, of, uh, of, of slides about. Um, 
the rest of the uh, uh, this is on the wrong slide. My apologies. The rest of the Festival of A Level Maths Conference on Friday uh, in London. Uh, Underground Maths will be there again, uh, uh, presenting and uh, around to chat during the day. Uh, we'll also have um, uh, presentations from both OCR and MEI exhibitions from uh, publishers from TUP, from Podder, also Texas and Casio there as well. Uh, so lots of stuff going on, uh, free conference um, if you're available to come along. Uh, there's, uh, of course, two more webinars, uh, sorry, one more webinar. We're in the, the penultimate webinar. The last webinar uh, is uh, starts in about 10 minutes, uh, which is uh, me talking about teaching mechanics um, in the new A-level maths. Uh, and all of the, uh, all 12 webinars from this week will be available, uh, the recordings will be available uh, from next week. Uh, we've also got a, a series of CPD events is specifically aimed at, at the OCR Math A uh, syllabus. Either myself or Stephen Walker will be running these uh, these days, proper hands-on days, um, uh, doing some some practical mechanics, doing some large data set activities, some further math stuff in the afternoon, talking and, and thinking about schemes of work and, and ordering the content, and in particular about co-teachability. And uh, if you're planning to teach OCR, either OCRA or, or B MEI spec, do please let us know on the link here. Uh, it's uh, so that we can we can plan resources and uh, and, and events and so on, as, and we know where you are and uh, and can can get in touch and and support. So the next steps, um, of course, we've got some questions coming in. That's great. Uh, and work, once the Q and A is is over, uh, do uh, and, and sessions finished, do have a look at our accredited specifications and sign up to, to CPD training. If you've got any questions for OCR specifically, you can get in touch with maths at ocr.org.uk. But I think most of you will be uh, opening your browsers and going straight onto underground maths. So uh, it's probably wasting my breath. So uh, thank you very much again to, to Tabitha and to Anna. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll pass back to them now um, at, and only jump in if there's anything OCR related. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we had a question um, about finding the resource spreadsheet. So, um, I'm just going to share my screen again and I can show you once again how to get to that. So, here we are. So, if I go back to the Underground Mathematics homepage, the spreadsheet is something for you as a teacher. It's something to help you in the classroom. So we go to your mathematical classroom, which is the purple button on the left-hand side. We scroll down, and we've got all these lists of things that we talked about and some additional things. And right at the bottom, there's a section called Prepare for the New A-Level. And then within this section, we have lots of information. But actually, at the bottom of the page, or if we go straight there, we have Resource Suggestions. And it's here that you can click to download the spreadsheet. We also had a nice comment about uh, underground maths becoming perhaps more useful as the course goes on because there's so many links between different areas of maths. Now, that's true, but it's not um, a, a barrier, I think, to using the resources earlier on. Lots of our resources sort of cross different areas and different topics of mathematics, but not in a, in a way that requires prior knowledge, just in a way that's often drawing in ideas from other areas. Um, so there are plenty of resources that you can use right at the beginning of topics, right at the beginning of year 12. And actually something we haven't mentioned, but I'm sure some of you are aware of, um, that actually given the new GCSE, lots of our resources, especially from this sort of top left area of the tube map may well be uh, great to use in your key stage four classrooms as well. Absolutely. And actually, the introducing calculus station, some of those ideas may be appropriate for some of your GCSE groups with the new GCSE. So I think we've responded to all the questions that we've had asked. As I say, we'll be here for a little while longer. And so if you do have any others, please uh, Please type them in and we'll do our best to respond. Um, but now we're just going to hand back to Antonio to finish off the uh, presentation. Thank you for coming along. And could we teach the whole course from our resources? Um, 
we would certainly see that you could teach a lot of the course from our resources. They are designed to be used throughout the learning rather than as uh, consolidation tasks. So we would ideally want them built in um, to teach topics from scratch using them. However, as I said at the very beginning, it is worth remembering we are a work in progress. So there won't be resources for absolutely everything yet. Um, so don't be disappointed if you are looking for something specific and you don't find it. There is a lot of stuff there, but we can only produce things so fast. So be patient and more will arrive. And like I say, there is a lot there that you could use, but we would suggest or we would expect you to also use your own resources or your textbook resources as well to complement what we've got. Okay, thank you everyone for attending. I think that's probably the last of the questions. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Okay, thank you very much, Anna and Tabitha. Um, we will just close this session now. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Have a very good evening. And if you've signed up for the following session, um, feel free to pop over right now. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>